very short. Perfect. That gives us more time for the discussion. Wonderful. We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us today at the IGF for a discussion on how to promote collective action to protect the healthcare sector against cyber attacks. My name is Roxana Radu, and I'm a research associate at the Cyber Peace Institute. I will be your host today, moderating this session with the aim to make it as interactive as possible. We're organizing the session together with our colleagues at the German Marshall Fund, and I'll shortly give them the floor for uh, welcome remarks. But before we start this conversation, let me just offer a few thoughts on what brought us here today. We have suggested this session because healthcare has become a target of choice for cyber criminals. Since the start of the pandemic, we have witnessed a sharp increase in the number of cyber attacks against hospitals, research labs, vaccination centers, resulting in serious disruption to the provision of healthcare and in direct harm to our individual and collective well-being. At the Cyber Peace Institute, we have documented many of these attacks on our cyber incident tracer to whether the treatment time for patients uh, had to be adjusted or delayed because uh, of a reversion to pen and paper or whether the rollout of um, COVID-19 vaccines uh, was impacted. Ultimately, it is human lives that are put at risk um, because of these cyber attacks. We've seen a number of responses to address this crisis and diplomatic, financial, technical and operational resources being mobilized to improve the situation. But how do we ensure that the sum is greater than the parts of these existing efforts? In the next 57 minutes or so, we will hear from our distinguished speakers their concise thoughts on what the problem is and what solutions we might need to explore to better protect the healthcare system. I'm very pleased to give the floor first to Bruno Lettem, senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund and co-organizer of this workshop. Bruno, please. Hi, Roxana. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. I'm uh, really glad to be here with you today and, uh, you know, I might have perhaps have the easiest job on this panel to, to welcome everyone, but uh, I'm really delighted to see such a group of experts coming together to talk about this issue. Um, and also from my side, uh, you know, let me just say thank you to, to our partners in this workshop, Microsoft and the Cyber Policy Institute. Your support has really been essential uh, to enable our conversation uh, today. Um, for those of you who do not know the German Marshall Fund, maybe you know, one or two words. Uh, we are an American policy institute headquartered in Washington, D.C., and we are also operating seven offices in, in Europe. And our mission is very simple. It's to strengthen transatlantic cooperation while working with global partners that share the same values uh, to address the most pressing issues of today. And cybersecurity is, of course, one of the defining topics uh, of our era. And especially in these times of, of pandemic, uh, the link with the healthcare sector is, of course, uh, of utmost importance. So at GMF, we, we share in the value to make cyberspace more safe, more predictable, more transparent, um, and not just looking at what governments can do in this regard, but also what businesses can do, civil society and other actors and how all these actors can, can work together. That's the approach that we believe in. And that's also why GMF thought it was important to be present uh, alongside our workshop partners uh, and our audience here at the, G at the IGF. Uh, but we also try to contribute uh, to a more safe cyberspace through other ways. Uh, GMF, for instance, is very proud uh, to have signed uh, two years ago the Paris Call for Trust and Security in Cyberspace that was launched in November 2018. Um, so, Roxana, you already explained uh, why we are gathering today. Um, again, I think it's, it's, it's a very important topic given that um, digital transformation has become the norm in, in the healthcare sector. And 
as the attacks are increasing, as, as you just said, it is really uh, not only impacting the infrastructure, but let's not forget it's also about people, about human life and, and well-being. So we should keep that in mind as well. So it's really important to strengthen the, the cyber resilience of the healthcare sector as well, and, and really to mobilize uh, human, diplomatic, financial, technical, and, and operational resources uh, to protect this, this sector. So that's what I wanted to say from my side. Uh, again, very glad to be together. And um, I'm really impressed by the fantastic group that we have here on, on this workshop. And uh, Roxana, over to you for a fantastic and enlightening discussion. Thank you very much, Bruno. Without further ado, let me introduce our stellar panel today. Representing different parts of the world and various uh, stakeholders, we're pleased to have here with us today Liga Rosenthal, Microsoft Senior Director and Team Lead for EU Cybersecurity and Emerging Threats, Pavel Mraz, the um, um, Cyber Policy Coordinator at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic, Guilherme Rosso, Head of Innovation at Pequeño Principe Complex, a 100-year-old institution that includes the largest pediatric hospital in Brazil, a college and a research institute, and he's joining us today from Curitiba. Welcome, Guilherme. And Clara Jordan, Chief Public Policy Officer at the Cyber Peace Institute. We are headquartered in Geneva, but we are a global organization. So we have a number of perspectives that uh, we can uh, um, include in, in our conversation today. Thank you all for accepting this invitation and um, let us get started. What is the reality of cyber attacks against healthcare today? We have documented a number of uh, attacks on our cyber incident tracer. We've seen the increase, but have there been any significant shifts in the way uh, hospitals have become targets, or is it more that uh, supply chains, the vaccine facilities are more in focus nowadays? Guilherme, if we can turn to you first, what have you observed in Brazil? Thank you, Roxana. It's a pleasure to be here at the Internet Governance Forum to discuss and learn about such an important topic. I would also like to thank Bruno, Clara, Roxana, and all the Marshall Fund and Cyber Peace Institute and all of us here joining the conversation. So um, I speak from Brazil and since I'm representing here the Latin American Caribbean group, I should mention inequality. Uh, and I would like to bring you just a few uh, point, uh, uh, data. So Brazil has a population of 213 million people and seven out of 10 Brazilians depends on the public health system known as SUS. Uh, and according to the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, 35 million people over 10 years old does not have inter internet access in the country. So uh, my first point here is, I think we should discuss also cybersecurity, attach it to the basic needs of society. So I think inequality is an important basic topic for us to, to address over uh, the next months and years. So bringing the conversation to hospitals, um, which is my experience. So several hospitals by seeing other being at cyber attacked, uh, started to give more attention to cybersecurity and started to create strategies for more preventive actions. In the case of Little Prince Hospital, which is the largest pediatric hospital in the country, uh, we are learning that the technical part is important, but as important uh, is also the, the human operation part. Um, we are now developing our digital transformation strategy, which we, did, we didn't have in the past. And it's based on cybersecurity, but also on training people to properly use technology. Um, I was, before the panel, I was talking with our medical director, which is also the first vice president of the National Council of Medicine. And he said, Guilherme, healthcare is an activity that belongs to society. So in this sense, it submits to technology and its consequences. So I think that's the context uh, that the Brazilian hospitals have to, 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 to change the way we, we deal with technology. It's part of our dynamic evolving processes. And uh, in the pandemic's context, I think the hospitals, as I said, by seeing the pain of other hospitals being attacked or with a lack of infrastructure to protect their database and their patients, they started to 
uh, um, design more preventive actions. But I think in Brazil, we have still a, a long way to go. And that's that's my first part of the contribution. Thank you, Roxanne. Thank you, Guilherme. Thank you very much. It's encouraging to see a change in mentality and to, to see that cybersecurity is now approached more at a systemic level. And obviously this is very important, not just for pediatric hospitals, but for the entire um, sector. And when you think about some of um, the changes that, uh, that we are seeing, obviously data is still a bit limited. It's uh, limited already because of the pandemic situation, but it's also limited because we simply don't have enough insight into cyber attacks. And so if we are to turn to an operator point of view and to turn to you, Liga, what have we learned about the protection of the healthcare sector since the start of the pandemic? Can you offer some initial thoughts on, on how the situation has been uh, changing since uh, March 2020? Yeah, thank you, Roxana, and thank you for all the participants. I Just a comment on Guy's remarks. I think it's excellent to have this perspective from Brazil, as many of us uh, that are on this panel sit together in Europe, but to have the vision of how this affects uh, issues globally is quite important. And, you know, that's the spirit of the IGF. That's why it's unfortunate that we're all sitting in our corners of the world and we can't come together. It's certainly that interaction that, that makes IGF such a, such a useful format in which to interact. It's, it's oftentimes what we say outside of this panel on the sidelines that, that gives us the most insights on, on really what the progress we can make in this space. But so look, addressing the question that you've been asked and trying to focus on the wide variety of responses from all sectors, um, and I mean from the kind of um, multi-stakeholder environment that works on digital security, cybersecurity, and healthcare, it's, you know, it's been a bumpy road. To say that we've learned so much and we've progressed so much is, is, is hard to say. There are definitely things that we've learned, but the question is, have we learned anything unique that we haven't learned from different sectors um, that have to address cybersecurity across different, uh, you know, different periods of time where they've been the most vulnerable? We've learned that the healthcare sector is extremely vulnerable and that, as always, the most vulnerable sector will get attacked despite um, very many efforts, whether it's by government, the private sector, or civil society, attacks will continue. That's nothing new. This is a very national issue, and it's very difficult to address at a global scale the cybersecurity of healthcare because each nation is very different on the handle healthcare. Some have a more private sector aspect, some have a higher level of digital transformation. And it's also important to see how different regions address healthcare. Uh, as I sit in Brussels, I very much see how the EU has addressed it through legislation. And this is certainly the case globally, that there's many examples of how critical infrastructures are addressing cybersecurity at this point and how we're all trying to learn from each other on what's the best approach. Uh, sadly, I don't think that you could legislate away uh, cybersecurity problems, but it's certainly a part of the equation. So how we approach it um, on a global, regional and local scale is extremely important. You know, we've worked in very many ways on working with very specific individual healthcare institutions. We've looked at where we can make an added value difference on, you know, protecting email, on, uh, on using our services to give the highest protection to those who are most vulnerable in the healthcare sector so that, um, you know, this doesn't have to be an issue of how much money you can put into it. It's, it's, it's um, the Microsoft approach to providing more protection towards existing customers that have not taken it into necessarily consideration to be able to alleviate that kind of pressure. So we work with many healthcare organizations, whether they're working in the high pharmaceutical life sciences or medical devices companies to provide additional protection. Um, I'll leave it to some of the different partners that are on this panel to address other cooperation, since we've worked very closely with the Cyber Peace Institute and the Czech government on um, protecting the healthcare sector from cyber harm. So I'll leave it to them to discuss these issues. We've tried to bring attention at the global level for how there have to be more, um, how cyber norms have to be addressed, how we can protect the ICT supply chain and working within the UN structures and the open-ended working group that will continue to work on these issues to incorporate uh, insights from 
um, the non-government sector. Um, I'm, I'm happy to provide more examples as we do look at this as a wide issue, not just a cybersecurity issue. We look at how AI for health can empower different organizations to address the tough challenges in global health, working with nonprofits, researchers, and different organizations, from simply to very understanding the basics of security, how data flows work, all of these issues somehow calculate into the security and attacks against healthcare sec sector. Um, I think I'll stop there and, and, and give an opportunity to other partners to speak and uh, we'll be happy to address further questions. Thank you, Liga. We note the regional differences and we also have an intervention in the chat from uh, Craig Jones, Director of Cybercrime at Interpol. And I was wondering if you might want to take the microphone for a few minutes to talk about what they have noted in their request for uh, Interpol support, I assume from various regions around the world. Craig, are you able to um, to take the floor? Yeah, happy to. Thank you very much. Um, some really insightful comments so far. Um, looking at it through the, the global, regional and national lens that we have at Interpol, certainly historically we, we've seen some attacks on critical national infrastructure, healthcare, etc. Um, some of these have been indiscriminate, but during COVID-19, we certainly saw an upswing um, in reporting from healthcare, um, whether it was a hospital, whether it was researchers, and they were being targeted specifically by cyber criminals because of the vulnerabilities, because of the actions they were undertaking at that time. They were, you know, very central to the work that was going on. Um, and also because sometimes they use legacy out-of-date systems, things like that, their, their vulnerabilities were greatly increased. Um, an example in Curaceo was one of the hospitals there came to us for support, and we used one of our private partners um, to help mitigate that attack. And that took a huge amount of intervention because of their infrastructure that they had. They had some real, real difficulties. And if you take it through just recently to the attack in Ireland on the um, uh, HSC there, and that's when we saw the real world impacts where the effectively the healthcare system was taken offline. And you saw people not being able to have their appointments, not being able to have the radiotherapy treatments. And that's an ongoing piece of work now. And then if you then take it to that collaboration and cooperation from law enforcement and private partners, how do we investigate that? How do we actually identify those threat actors where the infrastructure is? And then we come into the trust element there uh, through the geopolitical lines for countries working together in investigating, uh, detecting, uh, disrupting cybercrime. But also draws back to one of the key features we're looking at is, is prevention. So coming back to normal sort of crime in, in the physical sense, it's taking that now into that online space and whose responsibilities uh, is that? It's, it's a whole of society response. But actually what we're seeing now is it's, it's only when, if you have that burglary, you normally put a burglar alarm on your house after the burglary. You won't necessarily do it beforehand. And I think now people are starting to realise the impact and seeing the impact of this. It's changing, but... In some countries, it's not a priority. Um, and in the more developed digitalized nations, we are seeing that as a priority, but working in Africa at the moment, we, we, we look at the vulnerabilities there as well. So it works on many different levels um, and certainly Interpol's role as that neutral interlocker is trying to bring the countries together. And also I think uh, League was just talking about the, the new UN conventions and things like that. So we're very much gonna be in play on, on that side of it. And I'm really happy to be here as part of IGF. Uh, it's my first time in this forum uh, this week. And I, I think we have been missing from some of this conversation, certainly looking at how some of these are structured. So hopefully I'll, I'll be able to uh, be involved uh, in the future as well and my team will as well. So thank you very much. Thank you for this contribution. And we've heard from everyone so far about the vulnerability of the sector. We've also heard about the many actions uh, underway to better protect healthcare. So where are we falling short? You brought into the discussion, Craig, the UN processes, and I think we'll hear more about that from, uh, from Pavel, but I'd like to first ask uh, what he sees as some of the limitations to, to the current efforts, and then go into what are some of the areas that are explored diplomatically at the moment. Pavel? Uh, yes, thank you so much for the floor, Roxana. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you here today, one week before the OEWG meets again to discuss how we can take this agenda forward. And I think I would, where are we falling short? I think I would highlight three major things. And the first one is 
a lack of concrete support for implementation of the commitments we already made at the UN level. The second one would be, uh, we have still not been able to recognize that, that international law truly applies to cyberspace. And especially when it comes down to specific legal regimes like the IHL that would specifically protect hospitals, we're still having this basic conversation. And I think it's time to move beyond that to ask how it applies. And the third one is, not really recognizing at this point the linkages between the UN sustainable development agenda and especially bridging digital gaps and digitalizing developing countries on the one hand and cyber capacity building on the other. So uh, for the first one, let me just say for the support of implementation. So we have a recognition that healthcare sector is particularly vulnerable and it's part of critical infrastructure and we need to do more to protect it. We've been able to agree on that through the GGE and OEWG reports last year. And Czech Republic was one of the countries along with Australia, along with the United States, Kazakhstan, Estonia, Japan, and a couple of others that really tried to push this. So, but now that we have it, the question is, where do we take it from there? It cannot just stay a report. We really need to, uh, we really need to take this somewhere. Um, so we need to mobilize political will and resources to implement. And I feel that at the UN, uh, that there are a lot of states who want to move in the direction of making more norms and still leaving them on the paper. So I think we, we need to, at some point, really start implementing. So that's one thing. And there's a lot we can learn from past attacks. Czech Republic had its own attacks on hospitals. We adopted a number of measures, including legislation, doing cyber auditing, hospital-specific cyber drills, uh, and so on. And we would like to share that with other states to see if they can also, uh, if they're interested in similar measures. But unfortunately, the OEWG is not the right format for that. We would need different people in a room. So going forward on implementation, I think we will need to think very creatively how to create an inclusive permanent platform at the UN level so that we can have more technical crossover debates with industry, with civil society, and with technical experts. But we're not there yet. So that's one, one place where we're falling short. On the international law, obviously, with you know, there are different strands. The international human rights law and the right to live would obviously say you should not be attacking healthcare. It's a fundamental human right. There's also the IHL that affords protection to medical facilities and personnel in the time of armed conflict. There's due diligence principles and sovereignty, but we're still debating whether all these principles apply where really we should be talking about specific cases and what do we need to implement international law in reality. So, so th th that's another thing. And unfortunately, uh, some countries even say that um, uh, you know, IHL, for example, does not apply because ICTs do not fit the definition of a weapon. And I think this really takes us into a very dark place where cyberspace would be a sort of wild, wild west where no rules apply. So, so we need to have more specific conversations on that. And the last one on the linkages, I think Guillaume already mentioned the link between inequality and digitalization, and I could not agree more. Uh, bridging digital gaps is of the utmost importance, but we also need to ensure that as we're assisting with digitalization, uh, that uh, we have cyber resilience very much in mind. So, so far, cyber capacity building is sort of perceived as a niche or boutique issue. Uh, but it needs to go more mainstream. So we believe that, you know, at least in the UN system, whenever we have digital development projects, we should definitely think about how to add cybersecurity and cyber resilience components to these projects so that we're not digitalizing and creating new vulnerabilities, including in the healthcare sector, but instead we can start from the get-go by building cyber resilient healthcare in, in third countries as well. So I think these are the three main topics I would highlight at this point. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pavel. Um, especially appreciated the um, complementarity that you brought into the discussion between the normative and the operational side of cyber protection. It's, um, um, it's necessary to have both and it's necessary to work on multiple levels at the same time. From a civil society perspective, and I'm turning now to Clara, uh, why do you think some of the current efforts are insufficient? Thank you, Roxana, and I apologize uh, for my voice. I was not singing um, in a bar until three o'clock in the morning, but so sorry, I ha you have to listen to this. You know, I think uh, the 
what what is still not sufficient and what we still not understand that you know cybersecurity is an enabler to providing in care so i think it's really that mindset that we have to sort of adopt and access to healthcare and care is a fundamental human right so you know the motivation for protecting healthcare should really be you know looked at also from that perspective of access to this service, which is or which is a human right, so I think that's that's the first thing I would say it's really missing. The other thing it's really missing is understanding that human impact, you know, the impact on individuals of the attacks on healthcare. You know, we we talk about okay, well, a hospital went offline, but do we actually know what hospital being offline means for that provision? You know, so we we really need to understand how that impact on individuals is because I think that is an important motivator, you know, to the collective action um, and also to, to thinking about the accountability for these attacks. You know, I think there's a very interesting conversations in many circles around, you know, how we think about this collective um, collective uh, sort of impact of them on, on a society. And so the, the second point I would say it's missing is, um, is, is that understanding of, you know, that this is about humans. Um, this point is also very important when we talk about data breaches. I think we've, we've sort of gotten used to data breaches, including in the healthcare sector, but we really see them through sort of the privacy perspective. But I think there's another important uh, point we have to think about is how, you know, once your data is accessed, stolen and dumped somewhere, you know, how that opens you to re-victimization for life, you know, if your data about mental illness or abuse or past, you know, learning difficulties is somewhere on, you know, on, on a dump site, when your potential employer goes, you know, look for those because they now do that too, you know, that one data breach can learn, can lead to a lifetime of victimization. So I think that's, it's really important that when we're thinking about the kind of incidents that healthcare sector can be subjected to you know that we think about how these things really impact individuals and we really try to measure and understand it i think the the other uh, big issue where we're falling short is collectively making protection healthcare priority uh, pavel mentioned a, a handful of state who really pushed uh, the protection of this sector in the multilateral fora i mean it's such a small fraction of the international community you know so so really raising that awareness and, and bringing it to the forefront is super important. I would say the, the other point that I want to highlight is that, um, you know, that collective action also means sort of collective attribution. You know, it means political attribution of attacks on healthcare and really, you know, working with, you know, between the governments and the industry and law enforcement to bring them to the forefront like we bring to the forefront other activities of the groups, you know, whether they are criminal groups or nation state. Because I think where, you know, we talk about ransomware pandemic and, you know, we talk about all these, all these um, other sectors, but I think we really have to elevate the attacks on the healthcare sector, the perpetrators behind them um, to the level where we put other national security issues, because that's where, you know, I think the, the healthcare system is. Um, you mentioned, Roxana, the, the cyber incident tracer that we've done at the, at the Cyber Peace Institute. You know, we actually looked at a year of cyber incidents on the healthcare sector. And we really tried to look at, you know, what was the operational disruption? But more importantly, we also looked at, you know, who are the actors behind this? And for example, we realized that, you know, Top 10, you know, there's, there's 10 operators, cybercrime operators, and they account for 70% of incidents, you know, within a year. And we didn't even measure all of them. We, we had a pretty narrow scope. So the key is that we know who these actors are. You know, I think there is a lot of concerted action trying to go after them. But the reasons, you know, why we should go after them is that they're also attacking not only a sector, it's not only an economic issue it's not only a, a ransomware issue but it's really a um a, a individual issue um and it, and it significantly can impact the human life so i think it's really elevating this at the national security level that when we talk about attribution when we talk about law enforcement action um that it's really brought to the forefront not only that the sector is attacked but how it impacts individual life thank you
Thank you, Clara. Thank you very much for bringing in the understanding of what happens to our lives in the aftermath of an attack. It doesn't stop with the attack, unfortunately. It goes beyond that. It can have repercussions for uh, everything else we do. Uh, and also thank you for pointing to the need to stop impunity for such actions. Uh, obviously, the accountability framework um, it still requires work, but we are now at a better level of understanding as to what might be needed and how some of this uh, concerted action could uh, get us closer to accountability for um, such activities in cyberspace. So we've seen the extent of the problem, and we've seen there is a good level of motivation to collectively protect the healthcare sector. sector. But how do we ensure that these efforts are effective and that they do increase the overall resilience in the sector and that ultimately our access to healthcare is not uh, blocked. Liga, can we start with you on this question, please? Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, on this one, I think that often, you know, in my first intervention, I mentioned that there's global, regional, and national approaches um, to addressing cybersecurity of healthcare. But I think that also with trying to find practical solutions, we have to find in the same way um, how we can address different scenarios globally. And I think that we often overlook the small steps that need to be taken in one particular situation and it's some of those whole the, the some of the whole of of very small targeted projects and for one you know trying to find for us it's also important to find the right partners to make what we do most efficient most practical and deliver the most results so just a few examples that i can think of is that um, looking for ways on really addressing the, the kind of supply chain that's involved in vaccine production and distribution. We've partnered together with UNICEF to be able to provide a monitoring and tracking system to see how that's done so that we can, you know, help those who are helping others in that, in that particular way. We've, um, Pavel already addressed uh, issues on international law. And of course, we are not a government, but we do bring together, you know, policymakers and, and uh, the non-governmental sector to discuss exactly how the um, healthcare sector is being addressed through international law, where are the gaps, how these uh, issues need to be addressed. And um, in the last two years, we've brought together many legal experts to specifically produce uh, statements on the attack of the healthcare sector and vaccine research through the Oxford process, which has brought these, brought these independent um, lawyers together to really focus on what steps need to be taken globally. Um, and also, uh, Bruno mentioned earlier the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace. You know, this is a very high level statement on actions that need to be taken on cybersecurity. And this particular initiative began over three years ago when we didn't even have particular concerns about the healthcare sector, and it wasn't included as such in the Paris call. Of the you know over 1,200 endorsers of that particular call have focused a lot on the healthcare sector and raised awareness for issues on cybersecurity through that format in the last years so that we've brought a, brought on board many more participants from the healthcare sector to simply educate and have them have more visibility on what the issues are in cybersecurity because it depends it de while the healthcare sector is certainly under focus right now there are very many general principles of protecting various uh, sectors that could be applied to healthcare. So trying to find the right partners and bring in, you know, one hospital at a time to bring awareness has been quite important. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Guilherme now and ask how the situation looks like in Brazil in terms of the solutions that are approached, what uh, options are put on the table at the moment. Thank you, Roxana. Um, so in Brazil, the Brazilian Association of Private Hospitals is discussing some issues on cyber health and that I am aware of. But uh, the perspective is that in Brazil, it seems that the healthcare sector as a whole is not organized to propose collective solutions. So um, the perspective is, the situation is, we are discussing the issue at the individual level at the hospitals and at the companies. So it is a great deficiency for us at the moment to not have articulated action 
so that the healthcare sector is more protected. Um, Liga mentioned uh, the global, regional, and national perspectives. I would add two other perspectives, which are international uh, and also institutional perspectives, especially for a country as big as Brazil uh, or the United States or Russia or Australia or China or India, uh, Pakistan and others. And if we are going to, to, to manage uh, networks of discussions and group of discussions to protect uh, collective, collective uh, to, to organize collective action, I would say that regulation is not enough. There is a need for a culture of data preservation and communication technology operators need to be aware of data protection. I think this issue, in my perspective, in my perspective is, is an important one. And um, since we have a Q&A uh, time uh, uh, following our comments, I will leave uh, with two questions. So I work for, for reflection to the group. So I work in the largest pediatric hospital in the country. And by 2050, we will have a peak of 2 billion people aged 0 to 14 years old on the planet. And children are a vulnerable population by definition. So my first question is, cybersecurity protocols in the healthcare sector should be the same for adults and children, or do we need to think about extra layers of security for child patients? I don't have the answer, so I'm proposing for discussion. And the second is, how should we discuss cybersecurity, cybersecurity in the context of new technologies and the metaverse being developed? So including the use of expanded reality, sensors, networked biotech databases, internet of medical things. So the metaverse is coming. So how is going to be the cybersecurity uh, discussion on the metaverse? Thank you, Roxana. Thank you also for these questions that uh, will uh, make for a very stimulating discussion. Uh, very shortly, I will um, get uh, back to our speakers now and then I'll, uh, I'll ask these questions to the whole panel. Uh, I like very much what you said uh, about the culture of data preservation, and data protection that we need, and it links back to um, Clara's point about uh, a change in the mentality and how we approach uh, cybersecurity more generally. Um, so Clara, if you'd like to come in on this question, what are some of the solutions that we need to look at in terms of collective action? I mean, I think that, you know, from, from the perspective of the Institute, you know, I'll start, I'll start there, um, is, is really to think about how we can bring the perspective of the victims of these cyber attacks into the conversations, you know, whether it is to the diplomatic community, but also how do we better share it with at the national level with decision and policymakers so they can make informed decisions about how these things impact individuals and where to focus the measures that are being taken and how to prioritize action. I think that's very important. I also think that it's important to realize that no matter how much we invest in resilience, which is totally important and key, we will never defend our way out of this problem. It is, it is unreasonable to think that every small, where we are with technology today, and I think that we are moving, there, there's really positive steps where technology is moving, that we will be able to do a lot of the things at scale that we can right now do at the level of individual institutions, whether it's it's cloud or, or, or other things. We, I don't want to go, I don't want to charter in those territories. But I think overall, if we think about it, you know, it, it's hard to think that resilience will be achieved only through operational measures. I think that's where we really have to work on that concerted diplomacy and connecting diplomacy to the realities on the ground and, and bringing really the law enforcement, the industry um, and the not-for-profit community and, and the, um, the civil society into these conversations. And I think the, the other key, key action in, in organizing ourselves, and Pavel did mention this, uh, but I'll just reiterate the point because for me it's so important, is that those discussions we have in multilateral for have to be really concrete and actionable. Um, I, I do feel that states have to leave the conversations knowing where they should lead their action and what it actually means. Of course, every country has different setup and different governance frameworks and different institutions, but sort of understanding 
what what is the concrete goal that we're trying to achieve and what are the actionable recommendation is is very important and i think last you know i think that multi-stakeholder effort it, it is not something we can we can overstate um, we know that the inclusion of the, the perspectives on multi-stakeholder communities, many processes is still a challenge. And so I think that, that really working um, with those governments who understand the value and who are willing to promote the value um, will be key in helping others see and understand that, you know, that the industry, the civil society is there to provide a valuable input into the discussion. So when we have those discussions at the you know, on normative frameworks, again, they are very concrete and actionable and practical, and they can only be, you know, like that if they are informed by the realities, you know, whether from the industry or the civil society. Thank you. A very dark perspective there as that we will never defend our way out of the problem. And for sure, as you were saying, we will not do it um, standing alone. We need this collective power and, um, multiple actors to come together. And you mentioned concerted diplomacy. I'll uh, turn to uh, Pavel now to see what solutions are explored by governments at the moment and um, where is the Czech Republic contributing in particular? Uh, th thank you, Roxana. And I have to say, it's always a challenge to go after Clara because um, you know I, I can subscribe to everything she was saying. And on the diplomatic front, I think we as diplomats we're quite limited in our toolbox of what we can do. So, so for this question, essentially we can do, because the solutions are not with us, but we can do three things. We can build bridges, we can empower the right voices, and we can bring the right people into the room. So, and I think all, all of these three things have practical implications. For example, on empowering the right voices, I think what Clara said on really emphasizing the victim perspective in, uh, uh, when it comes down to cyber attacks on the healthcare sector, tremendously important. And let me use another example. When the UN was negotiating the landmine convention some 20 years ago, I believe, uh, nobody believed that there could be an agreement until civil society really showed what is the impact of landmines on ordinary individuals. And I think that changed the mindset and it really got the global community and the global public on the side of the civil society, pressuring governments to do more. So I think uh, if we can empower the right voices as the Cyber Peace Institute and others are already doing, it's important. For example, one concrete idea is recently in our workshops on healthcare sector, we had this one uh, IT specialist in a hospital basically saying that he's trying to raise awareness about how the uh, a hospital IT system is inadequate, but unfortunately the doctors who are in charge of the hospital are not necessarily listening. So one good idea Idea might be to take leading specialists in the in, in the healthcare, I mean among the doctors from all over the world and have them sign a letter that cybersecurity is important to basically change the dynamics and change the thinking of other doctors in the field. So I think this is something where diplomats can contribute. And on bringing the right people into the room, uh, I, Clara already mentioned this, but and, and I mentioned it as well, but we need technical specialists, we need people from national certs, we need people from industry, and we need them to actually debate these things and come to solutions together. And we do have this mechanism in other parts of the UN system, just not at the OEWG. Uh, I think the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a good example where policy, political and diplomatic and technical and scientific people come together to really agree on something specific. The, another example would be the ITU that has sectoral members. It has governments, but it also has industry. Uh, and uh, they do debate technical solutions. And I think on, on, on cybersecurity and cyber resilience, it's gonna be a mix of political, financial, diplomatic measures on the one hand, but also technical solutions on the other. So I, I would say I, I, we personally, well, as, as a government, we really support the French Egyptian proposal on establishing a program of action for responsible state behavior in cyberspace, which would actually allow us to bring all these stakeholders together to have thematic uh, solution-oriented discussions and to also facilitate capacity building on cyber resilience, including in the healthcare sector. And if this happens, the Czech Republic would be ready to contribute a lot on the healthcare sector. But right now in the OEWG framework, it's very difficult to contribute there. 
so so that that that's for us Well, indeed, we need this uh, coordinated approach, and I think we do need global responses. We've had a lot of uh, fragmentation in terms of uh, regulatory action and uh, even um, private sector initiatives, but unless we approach this as a global problem, we're probably not going to get um, closer to the solutions we're looking for. And I'd like to open the conversation now to um, everyone in the room, including physically in the room at the IGF, if uh, there is somebody joining us from Katowice, and uh, really invite you to ask your questions and add your comments either in the chat or ask for the microphone. Uh, I'll, I see a hand up from Liga. Yes, please, Liga, go ahead. Yeah, I don't want to jump ahead if there's other questions. I was just collecting um, some ideas and, and comments from what was already addressed from uh, Guy's first question to the panelists um, up until some of the last comments. And maybe um, I just start with, with Pavel's remarks. I was a bit uh, saddened that you said that solutions are not with us. I think solutions, but your comments at the end, you know, uh, addressed uh, solutions from the diplomacy side, because I think, you know, we all have solutions. We just have to find where our niche is to, 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 to deliver on those. And some may have more or less resources, but I think that's what the whole multi-stakeholder um, model, that's the benefit of it, is find resources because they're very scattered. So that's... that's. We can't hear you anymore, Ligam. Our mic went off. Apologies. On, you know, the question about do child patients deserve the same level of protection or do they need extra protection? I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a child safety expert. However, I think all patients deserve the highest level of protection when they put their information in the digital space and ensuring that you know, should not be in the hands of only their doctor. So how can you match, you know, the rapid advancements of what can be done in the healthcare sector with, you know, the, the healthcare providers' abilities to absorb that kind of technology and finding solutions there. And that kind of goes to the training skills and awareness that's definitely avail necessary throughout the cycle. And if you go back to, you know, how do children come into play? The best thing is that the chill that you know if we could address early education on cybersecurity, that would go already a long way. And I think that we're definitely in the position of, you know, kids often knowing more than we do in the digital space. Um, so this should be certainly something that's considered. At the EU side, we have difficulty because education is a national competency. So you know, on a regional scale, we can't necessarily do that, but we we do look for ways um with many countries to to see how we can improve the healthcare sector but um and also a bit about cybersecurity and the metaverse i think that you mentioned one other thing is that from the operator perspective and the provider of services perspective you know when the digital world started developing much much further you know the initial stages of the internet did not have security by design packaged in we are definitely working on improving those things and not only on cybersecurity, about a responsible approach to developing new technologies. And we've seen this definitely in the sector of AI, where we have, you know, responsible AI principles packaged in from the beginning when we start working on new technology, rather than having to be in the difficult situation where if you're working in cyberspace, that it was not security by design at the origin of the whole system. Thank you, Liga. Just to remind everybody, the two questions that we got from Guy um, were the following. Should cybersecurity protocols be the same for adults and children? And should we, how should we discuss uh, cybersecurity for healthcare in the context of uh, new emerging technologies? I see Clara also has a hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, you know, I think that the, I think I, I agree with Liga, you know, the, the, the privacy implications of, of any healthcare data, or I mean, any data period, um, I think can be can be so um, so tragic and and so impactful that you know the argument can be that the child you know the the period of victimization is long because it's going to live longer. But I think that 
you know, now starting to be research into the psychological impact of, of, of the data breach and cybersecurity incident and breaches of privacy and extortion and all of those things. So for me, that 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 goes for everyone. And I think, you know, I oftentimes think of, of about scale and um, I spend uh, a lot of quality time actually working in the industry. And I always thought, OK, well, it's wonderful that this one this one organization, this one hospital can 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 get this technology and buy this. But how do we do these things at scale? And so this also goes into the development of technology. That the technology is actually giving us solution where we can pull resources or have expertise or or work, you know, on security issues at scale. It doesn't have to be managed at the level of every single hospital. And I think that has been an issue in, in many countries that you know, the, the digitization or the security was not really doing as protecting the sector. It was really to protect one organization. And I think the, the development of technology is now giving us really an opportunity to think about, well, should we have a, a cloud for the healthcare sector? And what would be the benefit? And how would it work? And what is the role of the government? And, you know, so so as we're thinking about the the, the sort of operational resilience measure, for me, it's always to think about how can we do it at scale and not at the level of one organization, but at the level of the sector, because it is it is so important sort of for, for the individuals, but also for the for the national resilience. And I mean, you know, for me, the responsible development of any technology goes into the way we bring the multi-stakeholder community in it, you know, that you have the civil society who can talk about those implications, you know, they can raise those issues. You can have industries who say, look, if you do this five years from now, you will not be able to advance it or adapt it because you're going to get locked into something. And I think the, the, the dialogue between these communities is improving, but I think we still don't do enough. And I think it just can't be overstated that that community needs to be there no matter what, we, you know, no matter what we're doing. Yeah, thank you very much for, for these comments. And uh, it's also important to think about what uh, comes there from the beginning, what standards we design from the beginning and what comes as an afterthought. And obviously, privacy and data protection need to be integrated from the very beginning. I'm going to just go back quickly to Guilherme to see if uh, this answers uh, his questions and whether he would like to add anything, keeping in mind that we are approaching the end of the session. So I'll, I'll ask everybody to have very short interventions. Please give Thank you, Liga and Clara, for your comments and, and reflections. I don't have anything to add, Roxana. I think it's more a question of reflection. Um, and uh, I would like to hear more questions from the group. Thank you. I'm monitoring the chat. So if anybody wants to ask a question or pose a comment, uh, there's also the option of raising your hand and taking the floor. Meanwhile, if um, we have a little bit of time, I could ask Pavel about um, some of uh, the, the monitoring that they are doing uh, of the standardization processes. Because when we look at emerging technologies and some of the challenges they might pose for cybersecurity, we obviously have to talk about standards as well. Uh, so could you tell us a few words about how the diplomatic community is uh, closely monitoring what is happening in startup making organizations? So uh, th thank you so much. I, I think this is a brilliant question and it also goes to the fundamental issue of data protection and human rights protection, because at least from the standpoint of our government, we really want to have technology standards that are human centric and that are oriented toward ensuring that they are user friendly while protecting his or her personal privacy. And I have to say that in the recent years, especially at the International Telecommunication Union and in other standardization bodies, there have been a number of proposals that raise specific concerns as they regard to data privacy and human rights and cybersecurity issues. So I think that we are increasingly realizing that to have a truly trusted and human-centric digital transformation and new emerging technologies, uh, we really need to focus on security by design in the whole life cycle of these ICT products and services, which includes the standards. So I think that after a period of sort of withdrawal from of certain governments from the standardization sector, 
we're slowly coming back to also look into this issue to understand that we need to set these standards from the get-go. Um, I cannot go into more details at this point because efforts are still ongoing and some of these negotiations are quite sensitive, but I hope this, this answers the question. It does, thank you. Um, so if we turn around a bit the question and we say, what um, is civil society bringing to this conversation? Maybe we can ask Clara how we should raise this uh, standards for civil society participation in some of these fora and relatedly whether we should add standards for accountability with regards to healthcare but also beyond that you know i think the the how we organize sort of the civil society i think the the key is uh, at least the way i see it and we've done it in in some of our work is to actually reach out to the civil society from around the world and help them be part of those conversations. I think the, the one of the challenges, the way I perceive it now is, is that, you know, we have, we have well-established civil society actors who, you know, who provide a certain perspective, but, but sort of geographically, they work in one region or two regions. And I think there's lots of important actors who may be smaller and they may be outside, you know, the, the North America, Europe sort of, um, ecosystem where we mostly operate uh, because it's our natural environment you know so, so for me the, the what the civil society can do is to organize our, ourselves in a way where we reach out to those partners globally in the civil society and and sort of help to bring those voices together um, and and you know create a platform for them to bring in and those who are better established in, in these, in, you know, in the processes, who understand the processes, who understand how to engage, how to write a letter, how to write a statement, what processes are happening, what expertise is needed, you know, we could, you know, we could provide that platform to them. So, you know, how we can organize a civil society is by more outreach and more bringing those other, you know, other perspective into the conversations. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to that, um, Roxana, at this point. Thank you. And I'll um, just go back to Lika now to see if uh, she would like to say a few words about some of the ongoing efforts um, that the private sector is leading at the moment, um, including the series of workshops uh, on protecting healthcare from cyber harm and the upcoming report we could expect and what that might bring to practitioners in the field. Yeah, thank you. As I mentioned that we've been working together very closely with the Cyber Peace Institute and with the Czech government to work on different workshops on addressing cybersecurity and healthcare. And um, so on a, under a project of protecting the healthcare sector from cyber harm, and maybe I can uh, shamelessly advertise a little bit of the uh, multi-stakeholder engagement that's going on next week virtually, not, not quite in New York, on, on addressing these issues um, on a meeting on the margins of the open-ended working group that will be aimed at the diplomatic community, giving the insights that, uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to bring to the actual table during those discussions. Um, so I'll try to uh, find some links and post them in the chat if after making some comments. But I think um, not only during um, this particular project, but we've worked in the past on through the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace and bringing together actors and focusing on finding the best practices and and case studies in addressing cybersecurity in the healthcare sector. Um, and and this has been um, resulted in, in various reports. So let me see if I could find those put those in the chat so they could be available to others um, at this point. Thank you, Pavel. Yes, uh, thank you so much. And thanks to Liga for the promo of the um, action uh, for, uh, for the event that we're doing next week at the sideline of the OEWG as a Czech Republic, Microsoft and CPI. I just wanted to clarify that this will actually, despite the circumstances, or at least we're hoping that it will be uh, an in-person event. 
And what we're doing is that apart from the usual UN procedural stuff where you have a reception and you, of course, invite the heads of delegations and the member states, we're inviting the entire multi-stakeholder community, including the people who have contributed to this process over the years in their written contributions, but were never really allowed into the door at the UN to contribute. So uh, it will be an in-person event. And if stakeholders are in New York, they're cordially invited by my boss, uh, Richard Kadlchak, Special Envoy for Cyberspace to attend the event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we will have to end here because uh, we have no more time for, for our panel, but I'd like to thank everybody for their contributions today. Uh, including uh, in the chat. Um, thank you once more for making this a lively discussion and for guiding us through some of these convoluted um, problems we're facing at the moment. I do hope we stay in touch and I hope you can follow up on um, the links that uh, you wanted to share in the chat so that everybody can have access to that information and that whoever is interested in following our work in this space can um, can easily access uh, the information and join us in the future. Thank you very much. Have a good uh, evening and rest of the day wherever you are in the world. Goodbye.